of 11, Polo Tate knew she wanted to serve her country by becoming a soldier. So when she was accepted into the U.S. Air Force Academy, she thought she was on her way to living out her childhood dream. But in the midst of her experience as a cadet, Polo held on to a secret that she says threatened her physical and emotional well-being. Watch. At the age of 11, I had a pair of dog tags made that pressed my dream into metal and made it real. And that dream was I want to be in the Air Force. I wanted to be an officer. I wanted to fly. Polo was accepted by the U.S. Air Force Academy and became a cadet, or first-year student. She also earned a scholarship to play volleyball there. Not only do I get to be a part of the nation's greatest team, but then a volleyball team filled with women, strong, incredibly fierce, and already setting records in their sport. One of her teammates was cadet first class Tip Attila. Polo has renamed her so as not to reveal her identity. Tip was our team captain. We started out friends. What I didn't realize was our friendship was really her isolating me and sort of drawing me away from our other teammates. One night, Polo says she joined Tip and other volleyball players at an innocent team sleepover. We had all been talking in our coach's guest bedroom and eventually it had just become Tip and I. After talking for a long time, uh, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, she was on top of me, ripping my skin, clawing at my body and overpowering me. It was violent. I elbowed her so hard that I was able to bounce off of her and on the floor and run into the bathroom. And I got sick and I continued to vomit for the rest of the night, not knowing what had happened, what to do, what I was going to do now, but knowing that I was irrevocably changed. Hmm. Polo Tate shares her experiences in her new book, Deep Dark Blue, a memoir of survival. Welcome, Polo. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, you, the, you, would, you wake up in the middle of the night to find her on top of you. I did. And I know, I mean, woman on woman sexual assault is not widely discussed. You, you say this was a rape. Um, I mean, without getting too graphic, can you, can you describe what happened to you? She, well, that word is described as forcible penetration, which is exactly what it was. And without putting the viewers through any uh, violent detail, I woke up to her on top of me, overpowering me. And it's a good point that you bring up in terms of talking about female on female. And welcome to my world of agonizing shame and guilt and not saying a word. Just another layer of it. It is. On top of being an assault victim. Yeah. The... In the aftermath of this, what what were your feelings? Because she's you're you're at the the academy, you're fulfilling your lifelong dream, you're on your way towards something, and yet now you have this secret. You have to decide whether to tell, what to do. My the for cadets who go to the Air Force Academy, we are so driven, we are so self-disciplined that my first instinct was absolutely to lock myself up, to not say a word to pull myself up by my bootstraps and move on. That's the mentality That is the, the military. Mentality. That's the mentality, and it's widely, and it, it, it is widely expressed, widely encouraged. And, and it has to be in some aspect sure, right. to go into battle. So I understand that. Um, the problem with that is, is when you, when you compartmentalize, of course, you're not gonna be able to maintain that. It's unsustainable. And especially when you have to go and see the person or persons that attacked you every single day doing the sport that you love on the team that you trust. What was the dynamic like with her after that, like when you saw her? She never let a moment go by without knowing that she had power over me, outranked me in every way. My position on the team and at the academy itself was absolutely in her hands. And as naive as I was, when you're at the bottom of the pile as a freshman, that is the word. Yep. We 
uh, we are at the bottom of the totem pole. Right. So everybody is our superior. And, and truly, we hear these stories in the military. We hear them everywhere. But in the military, there's this extra dynamic of being trained to respond to authority, to respect authority. And as you point out, that's for very good reasons. But it can have these side effects in these situations, which we hear from men and women uh, about now. Three weeks later, I mean, insult to injury, when what happened? I was in my dorm room and uh, attacked by a male cadet. What did he say to you? He wanted to make sure that I stayed quiet about volleyball team secrets. Um, what he knew, I wasn't sure. I only knew what was coming out of his mouth, which was for me to keep silent. So you feel he was a, a friend of hers? That is the only conclusion that I can come to, though I have no factual. Yeah. I, I didn't hear them conspire. It's or an anything. assumption. It's it an is assumption. an assumption. So you don't, you didn't, you never reported either of these uh, in the beginning. Like you, you kept it no. a secret. Yeah. Um, but eventually, one day, you did confide about the first attack. I did to a friend, and that is where we are going to pick it up right after this break. Don't go away. <laughs> We're back now with Polo Tate, who says she survived not one but two sexual assaults while a cadet at the Air Force Academy more than 20 years ago. She's now written a book about her experiences called Deep Dark Blue, a memoir of survival. And that's an interesting cover photo on your book with the tape over the mouth. Um, because just given the dynamic that we've discussed and the, the power structure within the military. Yeah. And I think you brought up a good point earlier about gender. And it's, it, it's further proof that it isn't about gender. It's about power. And... This is actually a human issue that pervades. We've seen it in the Catholic Church. We've seen it uh, in college campuses, in Hollywood, and we've seen it in the military. And the difference is that in the military, when sexual violence pervades, it compromises our national security. Because if I'm worried about the soldier on my left and I'm scared of the soldier on my right, then I'm not focused on the greater mission at hand. I'm not focused on doing my job, and I'm not focused on protecting our beautiful country. Well said. The, the friend you confided in yeah. did the right thing and, and reported it. She did. And so the woman on the volleyball team went through a hearing and what, she was, she was kicked out of the she military? Was. She was kicked out. She wasn't able to graduate. Well, but hold on. Hold on. Because after they kicked her out, they let her back in? She, oh. yeah. She appealed it to the highest uh, officer in the land, the Secretary of the Air Force. And at the last minute, I think two weeks before her commission, she, it was overturned, and uh, she was able to serve. The, the, the man who came into your room was never prosecuted. You've never named him. You didn't tell anybody about it at the time. He, that, that you never sort of sought justice on. But can you tell us, what did this do to you? What did, how did it change you? I think it inevitably changes you irrevocably. I think there becomes a line in your life uh, from that moment, and everything before it is from a different space than everything after it. And my responsibility to myself, and it was my choice not to come forward and say a word, the trial that I had gone through uh, for the first uh, assault was horrific, and it took forever, and it nearly killed me. And I knew if I came forward with the gentleman, the backlash that I got at the academy was so gross uh, and so exaggerated for the first assault. You had to go through it again. Yeah. Why, do you, why is it a memoir of survival? I think it's my job to take responsibility for my life and my emotions. And I wrote this book as my catharsis. I wrote it to get to know myself, to get to value myself and love myself, to test my resilience and strength so that I could move on and contribute to this world. And I sought to get it published for everybody who is in solitary confinement of their isolation, if they can reach out and let a book into their chamber. I wish I had had it when I was going through it. I'll bet you anything there are people out there right now watching you same as we've seen them watch the Me Too movement unfold and right. feel just a bit differently about their own sexual assault or harassment um, or negative trauma in their lives. Thank you for writing it. Thank you. I want to tell you that the Air Force Academy did give us a statement. They said uh, that we have a responsibility to provide a safe environment for everyone at the Academy. And as an institution, we're disgusted and outraged by any instance of sexual assault. 
Unfortunately, they said in the mid-1990s, the Air Force did not have the rigorous system we do now to maintain records, to respond to allegations and support survivors. Therefore, they say we have no records of, of the report or what actions may have been taken, nor can we confirm the possible offenders. This is in no way, they add, meant to discredit Hello Story. We simply did not keep records at the time the way we do now. Listen. Thank you for telling the story, Polo Tate. All the best to you and with the book. We'll be right back.